so this is joint work with uh, Moda Yoga. Um, and, and I will start off by first giving a, um, a sort of like a, a broader introduction in terms of like what our research agenda is about. So um, as, as was just mentioned, sort of like a, our, our approach to sort of thinking about asset pricing is trying to connect portfolio quantities and asset prices to. And it, it's sort of like, like, like broadly motivated by the observation that a lot of the important policy questions that we're thinking about these days regarding financial markets and the real economy, that they involve shifts in asset quantities. So you can think obviously about asset purchase programs, but also a topic that we talked about yesterday, the growth of like ESG mandates, uh, global savings clubs across countries, across the wealth distribution, all of those involve changes in, in asset demand um, and, and their impact on, and we're trying to understand the impact on financial markets. Now, in order to quantify the impact of, of demand shocks, um, we need a model that, that sort of like well describes how investors substitute across asset classes and, and across countries. And I'll motivate why, why the cross country dimension is, is, is important. And so I'm gonna to refer to this as demand system asset pricing. And this is sort of a class of models uh, of asset pricing models, macro finance models, um, that tries to jointly explain not just prices and fundamentals as we've done um, um, historically, but also portfolio holdings. And, and sort of like getting that part right is essential to get sort of credible answers to these, to these important so that is sort of our, our, our starting point. Now, why is it important to have a global model um, of, uh, of demand? Now, one way to see that is to go back to the, um, to the PSPP and, and look at sort of like, like, like who accommodated the asset purchases by the Euro system between 2015 and 2017, for which we had data in our earlier, earlier project. And so the way to read this graph is that when, when, when the Euro system purchases one Euro of, of government uh, government bonds, like who is selling, how are those purchases accommodated? And so what you see on the horizontal axis here are, um, are different sectors. So we have banks, we have foreign investors, so those outside of the euro area, households, long-term investors, insurance companies, and pension funds, mutual funds, and then the leftover category. These bars over here correspond to sort of new, new issuances, which is, of course, another way to meet those purchases. And so the, um, the lighter gray bars is just the average for balancing. The darker gray bars is a better identified like, like measure of like who's taking the other side of, this, of the trade of the securities purchased by the Euro system. And, and an important observation here is that on the investor side, by large, the most important investor to accommodate these purchases are actually, your, are actually foreign investors, those, those outside of the Euro area. And so what it means is that in understanding the impact of purchase programs, we want to take a global perspective um, and think about sort of asset demand uh, globally. And so for the big picture, like, like any asset pricing model, any macro finance model uh, that thinks about asset prices is a combination of two things. One is a model of portfolio choice combined with market clearance. And so what we want to have is a model that matches cross country holdings uh, to explain global asset prices. And so what then drives asset price and what drives exchange rate? So in the setup that we're going to have, and I'm gonna sort of like, sort of like talk about today, is there's going to be like three broad groups that you, that you can think about. The first is, is demand from global investors. And in this case, a unit of an investor, think of it as a country. So think of like external positions uh, of, 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 of countries. And so these global investors, they are going to invest in assets uh, across uh, asset classes and across countries. And so they're gonna have a demand for short-term bonds, for long-term bonds and for, for equities, and they're gonna invest globally. Now their demand, we're gonna model it depending on obviously prices or expected returns. Um, it's gonna depend on macro fundamentals, capturing growth expectations, capturing the riskiness of different countries, as well as their sort of like unobserved expectations about those variables which I'm going to refer to as, as latent, latent demand. Okay, so that is, think of that as the, the first part of the demand side of the model. Then the supply of debt, there's supply of debt and equity by, by firms. And then there's the, the policy variables that, that sort of complete the model where um, central banks are going to set short rates. Um, debt quantities are going to be the outcome of fiscal policy and, and, and monetary policy. And then the last important group of, 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 of policy variables are going to be related to, to foreign currency reserves. So central banks hold non-trivial amount of foreign assets, and that's going to be an important part of the market clearing equation. 
So think of the model as, as combining um, a model of demand with market clearing, and then that demand is coming from various, from various actors, investors, and in part also from, from the policy. Okay, and that allows us to start thinking about why do asset prices and exchange rates, uh, exchange rates move, and how important are some of these policy variables. So more concretely, what, are we, what I'm gonna show you today is I'm gonna use data from 2002 to 2017. So we're gonna have data on the global financial crisis, the European sovereign debt crisis is gonna be part of the, um, part of the analysis. We're gonna to try to understand sort of the joint dynamics of exchange rates, asset prices, macro variables across 36 countries. It's gonna be developed, econ developed economies and, and developing economies. In terms of like, like the holdings data that we're trying to uh, understand, is we're going to look at the, um, at the cross country holdings uh, of the IMF's coordinated uh, portfolio investment survey, the CPIS. And so, we're gonna, we're gonna set up this model that's gonna allow us to understand why prices move. And then we're gonna use it to give a decomposition of variation in exchange rates and, and asset prices. And we're gonna zoom in particular on, on, we're gonna zoom in in particular on a couple of imp important events. So first we're gonna try to understand the dynamics in European, uh, European debt markets um, during the sovereign debt crisis and thereafter. So for instance, we're, we're gonna to try to understand why, why did the, the spread between Greece and Germany sort of like widen as much as it did? What were the spillover effects to other countries like, like Italy and, and Portugal? And what role did different investors play? What role did, um, did macroeconomic fundamentals play? Similarly, we're gonna sort of have a way of thinking about like, like longer frequency, lower frequency yield differentials between Germany and the US, which was, which was very large, uh, which were very large before the, uh, the COVID-19 crisis. Another, as another application of, of the same framework, we're going to think about sort of the estimating the convenience yield on, on U.S. assets, the sort of like special demand for, for U.S. securities. Um, and again, the same framework uh, allows you to, to estimate those, those um, the impact on prices, those effects. And then in progress, but I'll sort of like discuss a little bit towards the end of like how we're thinking about this. One thing that we're currently working on is to see whether the demand system approach could be used for real-time real policy analysis. And, and like just to give you a hint as to why the demand system may be useful is that it's, it's for two reasons at least. One is that obviously a lot of the interventions involve changes in quantities. And so a demand system is a natural, I don't know, natural framework to, to, to apply. But perhaps more importantly, um, what is particularly sort of like useful, we think potentially, is that you can consider demand shocks of different players at the same time. So if multiple central banks uh, all across different countries are implementing uh, uh, stimulus programs or purchase programs at the same time, the demand system can account for those for that combined shock as opposed to analyzing each shock in, in isolation. And so we think that uh, the demand system may be a useful way to, um, to analyze the real-time impact of these, of these programs. So, in terms of the um, in terms of the, um, uh, the, the the setup, think of it think of it as, as as follows. So, there's going to be an investor as a country, uh, and so there's 88 of those of those investors. So, there's 88 countries in our sample, um, and then there's foreign currency reserves. Now, for each of those 88 countries, we have bilateral positions. So, we know what let's say uh, Germany holds of Dutch Dutch equities, and then there's foreign currency reserves. So, so those are the uh, central bank holdings of of, of foreign assets. Uh, for reasons of confidentiality, we don't have the bilateral data. And so we, we sort of have to aggregate them to one investor unit that manages the foreign currency reserve. And so that makes, um, that makes for 89 investors in total. Now, what can those countries invest in? Um, there's 36 issuer countries for which we have complete data on prices and, and, and macro fundamental characteristics. And so those are like the investable securities, if you wish. Um, for each of those countries, we're going to have we're going to have three asset classes: short-term bonds, long-term bonds, and and equities. Of those 36 countries, there's going to be all 22 countries in the MSCI World Index, and then another 14 that are part of the MSCI Emerging Market Index. Now, one important aspect is if we're going to think about market clearing, is how we define how we define supply. And so, in the case of debt securities both long-term debt and, and short-term debt, um, we're gonna think of the total amount that's being held by foreigners. If you think about national accounting, then 
if 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 if, if the government issues if issues debt and it's purchased by its own by its own um, uh, residents, then that's going to cancel out in terms of wealth. Um, that's not true for equities. So for equity, sort of what is held internally counts as as wealth, but that's not true for debt. So total supply of debt is whatever is held externally. Equity is total market market capitalization. Okay, so let me first give you a feeling for what the data what the data looks like. So what you see over here are the uh, top ten investors by asset class. And so the first column is for short term debt. The middle column for long term debt, and the, the the column to the right is for for equity. And and so there's three important observations about about this uh, about this table. First, you see that short term short term bond markets are smaller than long term bond markets, and they are again uh, smaller than than equity markets. The second observation is that if you look at the largest investor in short and long term bond markets, then these are foreign currency reserves. So foreign, foreign currency reserves play a non-trivial role, and you'll see that they will come up routinely in, in the different analyses that we, that we do. The third observation is that, again, in particular for short and long-term debt markets, you see that financial centers are quite important. So you see like, like Ireland, uh, Luxembourg, and, and Cayman Islands as important sort of like pass-throughs um, and financial centers that play an important role in the global, global financial system. Now, in order to start connecting prices to quantities, I, I want to sort of like, like start emphasizing one idea that sort of runs through our, our, our research, which is that, that financial markets tend to be quite inelastic. So what I mean by that is that, that relatively small shocks, relatively small shocks to, um, to, let's say, beliefs or flows or anything like that can have non-trivial impacts on, on prices. In a lot of the standard macro finance models, demand is very elastic. So, so a lot of those shocks wouldn't matter. And so the way a lot of the standard macro finance models work is that you have very volatile, let's say demand shocks or belief shocks that, that are sort of like hidden fairly elastic markets. In a lot of our work, we find that markets are in fact pretty inelastic. And so what it means is that suppose you have fiscal or monetary policy interventions that affect the supply of debt. Then if the market is, is quite inelastic, then let's say that there's a lower supply of long-term debt in the euro area as a result of QE relative to the US. Then what's gonna happen is that you're gonna push up prices and long-term yields are gonna fall. Now the impact on exchange rates is gonna depend on what happens to the, the quantity of, of, of short-term debt. Similarly, if equity markets are inelastic, then if European firms issue more, issue more equity, then equity prices will fall. Uh, for markets to for markets to clear, and the exchange rate uh, may may depreciate in that in that case as well. And so, the more inelastic markets are, the more quantitatively important these 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 effects are. What I'm going to show you in the next two slides is just some suggestive scatter plots that these effects are at work. So I'm going to show you scatter plots of changes in quantities, relative quantities, and changes in prices. And what you will see is that sort of like in all cases, there's suggestive evidence that demand curves are, are downward sloping. So what you see over here is the relationship between the, the debt quantity in a given, given region or country. So top left is the euro area, Japan, Switzerland, and the UK. And it's the debt quantity relative to the debt quantity in the US. And so the way to read this, for instance, if we take the euro area, then the numbers in the boxes, they correspond to years. So if we go to like 2015, 16, 17, then you see that the total amount of debt that's being held by foreigners is going, is going down. That is consistent with the first graph that I, that I showed you. Now, at the same time, you see that prices go up. The price of, of, of Euro area bonds goes up relative to the price of US Treasury. And, and so that phenomenon you see sort of show up in all of these figures. A relative change in quantities is, is associated with it, with the change in prices, and that sort of suggestive evidence of downward sloping downward sloping demand curves or inelastic markets. Similarly, in, in in global equity markets, and so the horizontal axis here is the change in or the, the relative amount of of equities book equities outstanding in a given country relative to to the U.S. The vertical axis gives you the relative price in let's say the euro area relative to the US. And again, you see this sort of downward slope. So if, if European firms issue more, issue more equity relative to, to US firms, 
see that the relative price of U.S. equities falls relative to the price of, of uh, the price of your area equities falls to relative to the price of U.S. U.S. equities. Okay, and so that's going to be an important feature of of our work, and it's something that that's gonna um, be pretty clear once you start looking at prices and quantities together, and you try to estimate slopes of demand curves. A common feature is that demand appears to be uh, inelastic, substantially more inelastic than what's implied by our models. And that's a really important message because if you're going to use pretty off the shelf macro finance models to assess impact of quantity shifts in demand, you may easily get the wrong answer because you're using a, a demand curve that's just too, too elastic. And you may understate the effect as a result. Okay, so this is just suggestive evidence. So what we're going to do now is we're going to we're going to have a framework that allows us to formalize things things a little bit. Um, so there's a couple of equations I'm going to use um, just to describe sort of at a high level what we're what we're doing. And so sort of like keep in mind the two basic ingredients of the model are the market clearing equation, which is obviously like any model, and then and then there's going to be a model of demand. And the model of demand is going to be sort of empirically tractable to get reasonable substitution patterns across countries and asset classes. So let me sort of like first define what we have over here. So the market clearing equation is going to hold for a given country and a given asset class. So let's say this is for German, German equities. Then what we have on the left hand side is total supply. So it is the price per unit of, of the asset. So in this case for equities, it would be the market to book ratio, or in the case of a bond, it would be the price per unit of face value. So this one is unitless in terms of in terms of currency denomination. Then the quantity over here is in case of equities, the total debt outstanding or the total face value in case of uh, in, sorry, the total book equity in case of equities and the total face value in case of bonds denominated in local currency. We then multiply it by the exchange rate, which is the number of, of dollars you pay per unit of foreign currency. And so the left hand side here is the total supply denominated in, in dollars. Then what you have on the right hand side is, is total, total demand. And so we have the, um, um, it has two components. One is the assets of, of the different investors. So uh, on the, the subscript I here corresponds to an investor. And then WIT and L is the fraction that a given country, let's say the Netherlands, is going to invest in a given year into German equities. Okay, and so we then add this up across all the investors. So what you have on the right hand side is, is, total, is total demand. Okay, and so the way the model is going to work, if you want to think about experiments related to, let's say, QE or a change in ESG mandates or whatever sort of experiment you're interested in, is essentially we're going to change the demand on the right hand side, or you may want to change sort of the quantity of that outstanding in the case of QE. And you're going to resolve for the system, and then if these parameters are are stable, then we can sort of like use this sort of setup to forecast how prices would change if parts of the demand system would be would be modified. Okay, so that is sort of the the market clearing equation. What we're then going to do is we're going to model um, we're going to model the total total demand. Now, in terms of total sort of number of equations that we have. We're going to have three asset classes. So the short term debt, long term debt, and equities. For short term debt, we're going to assume that within the euro area, there's one price and that there's no differences across countries. So that in total gives us 26 countries uh, plus the euro area for, for short term debt markets. So those are the equations we need to clear there. Then we're going to have long term debt in 36 countries and equity in 36 countries. Now, the assumption that we're going to make that's going to be important in interpreting some of the results from also from a policy perspective is that we're going to assume that the central bank is going to choose the short rate. So we're going to take that one as given. But if you're going to take the short rate as given, then you don't sort of naturally clear the, the, the market clearing equations anymore for short term debt. And so for short term debt markets to clear, something else has to adjust. And what we're going to assume is that it's the exchange rate that is adjusting. So we're going to have three sets of market clearing equations and the endogenous prices that we sold for are exchange rates, long term yields and and equities. What the model is going to do, it's going to have it's going to match cross country portfolio holdings. We now want to have a, an easy to estimate model of, of demand and demand elasticities that allows for flexible substitution within and across asset classes. And so what the next slides will do 
is to give you a model for demand over here for this for this component. Okay, so our demand is going to have two components. One is a an allocation across asset classes, so an allocation across, let's say, equity markets and and bond markets. And then the second part is within a given asset class, your your allocation across countries. So between let's say the UK and and Germany. We allow for this separate structure to give us more flexibility and to not assume that that markets are perfectly perfectly integrated. If markets are perfectly integrated, it would be a special case, and we would we would we would be able to estimate that. So how we're going to model the demand in a given asset class across countries? So the demand over here, let's say for the UK in in equities, is going to depend on these deltas relative to to capital D. Capital D is nothing else than one plus the sum of the deltas. Think of that as the relative attractiveness of a given asset class. Now, these deltas over here give you the, the, the demand that you want to have for a given country in that asset class. And it's going to depend on three components. One is expected returns. Beta L is going to control like how sensitive you are to, to expected returns. Then it's going to be other observable characteristics. So here you're going to have let's say inflation, uh, GDP, GDP per capita, risk variables, ratings, things like, things like that. Uh, also trade relationships, other variables that you can observe that, that you think drive demand across countries. And then there's going to be unobserved demand shocks. So those could be expectations about those macro variables in, in the future that we don't observe as, as economic weakness. Okay, so that's the demand model within an asset class. Then across asset classes, we're going to have a model where you're going to have this capital D, which measures the relative attractiveness of a given asset class, let's say short-term bonds, long-term bonds, or equities. The key parameter to look for is this lambda over here. If lambda over here would be zero, what that means is that in my allocation across asset classes, I do not pay attention to the prices of, let's say, equities relative to bonds. So that will be a very extreme sort of like form of segmentation. If lambda over here is one, then you would have perfect substitution, similarly as the within asset class substitution. So what that would mean is that if lambda is one, then I consider the substitution between UK equities and German equities to be the same as between UK equities and German bonds. Now that also may be sort of too sort of strong a view. And so what we're gonna find empirically is that the estimates of lambda are somewhere between 0.2 and 0.5. So markets are integrated, and it's important to think of these markets jointly, but they're not perfectly integrated to the extent that, that, that stocks between two countries are equally close substitutes as, as equities in one country and bonds in another country. Okay, and so it's important to have this slightly more flexible structure to understand the global impact of demand shocks. Okay, so now bringing the model to the data. So what are the observed characteristics we're using? So we're gonna have macro variables GDP, GDP per capita, inflation, equity volatility, and sovereign debt rate. In thinking about these variables, um, there's a micro founded model that we have in our earlier work where you want to choose those characteristics to capture measures of risk and, and expected return. Okay, and so, so, so these are sort of the natural variables that we, that we thought um, one would include. Now, there's also um, um, a large literature showing that import export share and distance matter for cross country allocations. Um, and so we account for that as well, uh, as well as home bias. So on average, firms hold way more of their own equity than, than equities in other countries. So it's important to account for that. There's going to be year fixed effects. And then to capture the specialness of U.S. assets, we're going to have a U.S. fixed effect interacted with with the year. Now, in terms of estimating the model, one has to be careful because prices are endogenous to latent demand. If a certain if there's a lot of demand that's unobserved to us, for a given country is going to drive up its price. And so demand shocks and prices will naturally be correlated. And so, so, so we, we develop an IV strategy, instrumental variable strategy to estimate the demand elasticity. Okay, so let's look at, the, um, at what demand looks like across these asset classes. And so the way to read this table is that the first, go, the first line over here tells you the sensitivity to expected, to expected returns in three asset classes. First column, short-term debt, then long-term debt, and then equity. And if you want to translate this to elasticities, then the demand elasticity for short-term debt is around 40. It's around four for long-term debt and around two for equity. 
All of those suggest, and in particular for long-term debt markets and equity, that demand is fairly inelastic. For long-term debt, um, uh, the estimate of around four is quite consistent with the event study estimates that we have about the price impact that, that QE has had on, on government bond markets. And if you look at the, if you go down the, the different rows, then you see there's about a unit elasticity with respect to GDP. So larger countries, you're going to allocate more capital to it. Um, inflation has a negative impact on demand across all asset classes, um, but particularly for short-term bond markets and long-term bond markets. The risk variables work in the direction that, that you would imagine. So higher risk, you see lower allocation. So that's the standard risk return trade-off that is observable in these holdings. Um, Import and export shares, so there's some notion of either familiarity or, or other, other, other forms of connections between countries that drive, that drive demand. Similarly for distance, so countries that are closer together, you see a larger allocation. Lastly, for equities, um, there's a strong home bias effect. So on average, you allocate seven times more to your own country compared to, compared to others. Um, so that sort of like gives you a flavor of like what, what estimated demand, demand looks like. And what we're going to do now is, and I'm going to sort of, what we're going to do now is to use the demand system to try to understand like, like fluctuations in prices and how important different types of, of, of variables are to explain, explain exchange rates, long-term bond prices and equity prices. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take one year and go from one year to the next. And we're going to move the variables one step at a time. So let's say we first move the macro variables, um, including equity quantities, from 2015 to 2016. Then we solve for all the new prices in equilibrium, and that's sort of step one. Then we think of like, think of conventional monetary policy. So we move short rates and short-term debt quantities. Again, we solve for prices. Then we do monetary fiscal policy. We move long-term debt quantities, solve for prices and so on and so forth. By the time we move all five of those, of those variables, those groups of variables, we get to the next year's prices. And so then we do a variance decomposition, ask how important are these different variables in explaining exchange rates, long-term yields, and, and equity prices. Okay, so if we, um, if we summarize those, that variance decomposition, then what you get is, is the following. First column is exchange rates, second column is long-term debt, third column is, is equities. So the first observation is that this, these three bars are reserves, debt quantities and short rates. In all three asset classes, uh, and in particular for long-term debt, policy variables are, are important. And so they have a large impact on fluctuations in, in financial markets. The macro variables explain 25% in exchange rates and another 30% of, is explained by policy variables. The remainder that we cannot explain is coming from these unobserved demand shocks. Now, what is interesting, though, is that we can decompose this unobserved demand by country and by asset class. And I'm going to use some of that, some of that later on. For long-term debt, again, policy variables are important, and in particular, uh, debt quantities. Okay, so fiscal and monetary policy plays a particularly important role in, in, in this case. Um, if you go to equities, macro variables are, are, are explaining 60% of the variation, which is to a large extent driven by the risk, risk variables. Okay, so let me now zoom in on two particular two particular questions um, that 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 perhaps are particularly relevant here. So one is understanding the 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 yield spread between Germany and the U.S., which was very large um, before before the COVID crisis. So U.S. long-term yields were somewhere around two uh, percent, um, and and German yields were were negative. And so the question is like, why do you get this large 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 yield spread between the two sort of safe countries? A second sort of like, like, like application of this is to look at what happened during the European sovereign debt crisis um, to, to the southern European countries like Greece, Portugal, and Italy, and Germany, and how do we understand the, the dynamics of the yield spreads during those, during those episodes. So we're going to do exactly the same decomposition. So we're going to move one of these variables at a time, and we're going to ask like, like what can explain these, um, these yield dynamics. So let's first look at the difference between German yields and, and U.S. yields. And the thing that jumps out on you is that, that the policy variables are incredibly important. So 88% of the variation is driven by, uh, by these policy variables. So 53% by short rates, 15% in, in terms of debt quantities. Okay. Now, 
given that it's sort of like so strong, you can actually see it in very simple scatter plots. So these are similar style plots that I showed you in the beginning, but now the horizontal axis is relative short rates in Germany and the US um, and relative quantities in Germany versus the US. What you see on the horizontal, on the vertical axis is the German yield minus the US yield. And you see this very strong relationship between, um, between changes in short rates and changes in long-term yields, changes in debt quantities and changes in long-term yields. So as for instance, over here at the bottom left, as debt quantity outstanding held by foreign investors goes down, you see that the German yield falls a lot relative to the yield in, in the US. And that is sort of an important driver of of the um, of the yield spread between the two between the two countries, and so this is really identified and sort of like pretty salient in scatter plots because the times of monetary easing was quite different across the two across the two geographies. Now, if we look at the at the yield spread and the dynamics of yields during the European sovereign debt crisis, like we think a really interesting picture emerges. So what you see over here, top left is Greece, then it's Italy, and then here you have Portugal. The, the solid line, that's the change in the yield spread. So the yield spread jumps up uh, by, by, by something around 15% and then comes back down. And then there's no further, not much of a, I don't know, of a change thereafter. Now, how does the model interpret this sort of change in the yield spread? In the model, we can explain this almost entirely by the, 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 the dashed line, the little less of the, the smaller dashed line, which are macro variables. And so, to understand the spread between Greek yields and German yields, we don't need to rely on demand shocks. We can explain it with macro fundamentals. Interestingly, at the same time, as we all know, like the yield in Italy and the yield in Portugal also jumped up and came back down at the same, at the, in sort of at the same um, time as the Greek yield came back down. Now, here, we can, the model can't explain it with macro variables. And so, so what, it, what the model is doing is that it's, it's attributing all the variation in those yields to latent demand. And so there's sort of a spillover effect from what happens in Greece where the macro variables are shifting to the demand shocks in, in, uh, for Italy and Portugal. But what is sort of like we think is useful about the demand system is that you can take it one step further and you can now ask, well, whose demand shocks gave rise to the, to the jump in Italian spreads and, and Portuguese spreads? And so if we go back to the table that I just showed you, here you see a decomposition of like of latent demand. And so the most important component of latent demand are in fact other European countries. And so the narrative that emerges from, from, from this analysis is that the spread between Greece and, and Germany is within the model well explained by just changes in, in observable characteristics. That's not the case for Italy and Portugal. So those are demand shocks. Think of that as sort of like contagion under the microscope. But then you can take it one level further and you can see whose demand shocks it are. And it's in fact other European countries who rebalance away from uh, Italy and Portugal. And that's why their yields, yields then spike up. Okay? And so that gives you a better understanding as to where the price dynamics comes from instead of just seeing all the yield spreads spike up and come down, come down at, the same, at the same time. So we can truly attribute sort of every variation in the yield or in equity prices to any given, to any given investor. Okay, so to, um, as a last application, what we do is we look at sort of the convenience yield on, on US assets. And so there's been a lot of discussion of the special, special status of the dollar as a reserve currency. And so the way we're capturing this in the demand system is as fixed effects for US issuances interacted with year. So the convenience yield or the specialness of US assets or dollar assets um, can change can change over time. Now, what is sort of different from what we do compared to uh, some of the earlier literature is that we estimate this in all asset classes. So there could be special demand for U.S. equities for reasons we can think about, or or long-term bonds, or short-term. And so what you see over here is that there's very strong additional demand for U.S. assets. And if you sort of like would take that out, there would be a very large effect on on long-term yields in the in the U.S. And so this is a different approach than the typical approach, which is using sort of like an, an arbitrage argument where two near perfect substitute assets trade at trade at different prices. So like the work of like like Annette uh, and Arvin has been sort of like seminal in this in this in this context. And what this what this is doing is essentially saying that, well, all of the U.S. assets could be in special demand. And how strong is that demand and what would be the price? effect? So that's essentially what this calculation calculation tells you. 
Okay, so what we're currently doing is to see whether the um, whether the demand system is useful in real time uh, to evaluate monetary policy. And so, so why do we think that this could be sort of like helpful beyond sort of like using estimates of, of event studies and extrapolating those? Um, we think there's two main reasons. One is that current fundamentals and current ownership looks quite different from, let's say, 2008, 2009, where some of the other estimates are, are coming from. And secondly, sort of by the nature of an event study, what you're doing is you're looking at sort of like one central bank's action at a time. But really what you're interested in at a somewhat lower frequency is the fact that the ECB undertook like, 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 like several steps, the same is true for the Fed, for the Bank of Japan and so on. And so you really wanna understand sort of like the role of the, the combined shock and the marginal impact of your own shock on that. And so the demand system potentially allows, allows one to do that. And so what we showed in our earlier work is that sort of if you can forecast demand, then you can forecast, you can forecast price. Um, and so the way sort of the, the setup would work is you would calibrate prices holdings and fundamentals to the pre-COVID, uh, pre-sort of announcement values. You feed in the monetary policy shocks kind of all across all across the world and you compute counterfactual prices. The better predictions that you have for characteristics, let's say volatility or economic growth or asset quantities coming from fiscal policy, all of those um, would, be, would be useful. Of course, you'd be worried about sort of like, like issues related to, um, to Lucas critique and what have you. Um, but the whole goal here would be to say, like, what are the best estimates that we have to forecast the impact of purchase programs, which would, we think, come from event studies, and to see, like, like how far can we come with, uh, with, the, uh, with the demand system approach uh, in predicting those, those effects, and then compare out of sample um, which method works better and where the, the successes and failures, failures are. So that's where we're going. So let me, uh, let me wrap up. So the main um, idea behind the demand system approach is to use prices and quantities, portfolio holdings together. And we think it provides a new way to interpret sort of the dynamics of, of asset markets. So I gave you the example of the German US yield spread, the European sovereign debt crisis and all. Now, one of the things that, that is quite salient in the data is that there's substitution across asset classes and across countries. And so what it means is that to understand these effects, of let's say QE, it is important to understand the impact on exchange rate, long-term yields and equity prices jointly, and to think about it in a, in a global, global framework. Our estimates suggest that policy plays an important role um, for exchange rates and asset prices. And so what you see over here by asset class uh, or by endogenous price, how important different policies are, short rates, debt quantities and reserves, and you see in all cases that it accounts for a non-trivial fraction of price variation. And so in ongoing work, as I mentioned, we're sort of thinking about potentially ways in which this framework could be useful for real-time real -time policy analysis. Um, and hopefully that could be, could be a new tool uh, for, for central banks. Thank you. Thank you, Ralph, a very, very interesting paper. Um, uh, I, I have two questions. So I, we receive, uh, receive two questions. So let me read, uh, read them one uh, after the other. One is from uh, Wolfgang Lemke. By the way, it's a question I would have asked if it had not been asked already. It's on negative, negative interest rates and negative yields. So um, Wolfgang asks, uh, bond yields are negative in some countries. Uh, some claim that portfolio rebalancing works differently under negative rates. Uh, can your model explore that more generally? Can you check whether supply demand interacts uh, differently uh, with negative bond yields? And maybe you answer that and then I'll, I'll come in again with another one. Thank you. No, I think it's a terrific question. And in fact, uh, you can. So, so, um, so one thing that you can do is, um, is currently the coefficients are uh, stable over time. And, and, and do not depend on state variables. But what you could do is to say, well, maybe the level of interest rates matters for demand elasticities or for your attitude towards like risk or generally like some notion of like reaching, reaching for yield. And so the way to think about it is that uh, if I go back to the, to the model to make it concrete, these coefficients over here, uh, the betas and gammas, they may depend on the level of interest rates. So if you think that demand is more elastic when interest rates are negative, 
or that uh, investors are more willing to take risk if interest rates are negative, then essentially what you can do is you can model these coefficients as a function of interest rates or allow for a nonlinearity uh, around zero. And those coefficients would then change. And so what that would mean is that sort of substitution effects would change and the impact of QE would change if you, if you operate in this negative interest rate environment. Similarly, if there's like in investors, let's say insurance companies that, or pension funds that have promises uh, as to guarantee a certain rate of return and they, they wanna have higher yielding assets as a result, um, you can build in similar effects as well. And so anything that depends on other variables, you could in principle sort of incorporate it and test whether those effects are, uh, are sufficiently, sufficiently strong. Uh, thank you. There is another uh, question now just coming. Um, Elena Febrel asks, are variable variations exogenous or endogenous in your model? Okay, so it's a great question. So everything is, in principle, everything is in, endogenous. If you think about sort of the bigger picture macro, macro model. So, so the way I view to the current estimates is really as a, as a variance decomposition. So, so we're just sort of like, we, we, we're decomposing demand and we're trying to understand which of the variables explain, um, explain demand. Now, where we wanna go in terms of like the longer term like research program is to endogenize those, those characteristics as well. And so what you can sort of think about is, and we're trying to do some of that for the, um, the real-time policy analysis sort of like framework. What we're trying to do, or what you would like to do is to endogenize the macro variables, so firms, investment decisions, issuance decisions, and so on, um, but do that in, in the presence of a realistic, realistic demand system. And so one way to think about sort of the framework that we have here as kind of an endowment economy. So taking the correct risks as given, you could do asset prices. But then, so the next step that you that you that you want to do is to go to a production economy and endogenize endogenize those as well. Now, sort of like the the the, the macro models we currently have are not sort of like sufficiently sort of like advanced that we can deal with like like very high dimensional I don't know like thirty six countries like we have and do dynamics. And so so there's a trade off here in terms of like what you can and cannot uh, endogenize. But for now, think of it as like a variance decomposition that you can run both in any model you're gonna write down and we can compute it empirically. And empirically is telling us sort of like, gives us a narrative as to why, you know, why markets move. You can use it for forecasting. We showed that in our earlier work. So demand is sufficiently stable that you can use it for auto sample forecasting of, if you can forecast demand, you forecast prices. And so we're sort of like hoping that if demand is sufficiently stable or we can capture the key dimensions in which the demand shifts, that once you use it for forecasting, let's say QE or something like that, um, it would still provide useful uh, predictions for how prices uh, and exchange rates would, would move. Uh, but that's really sort of like, um, it's such a great question. And ultimately, um, we would like to endogenize characteristics as well. Uh, there is one last maybe question uh, from Tilman Bletzinger. To what extent are asset prices in your model not uh, explained by fundamental policy and demand factors? Uh, is there scope for irrational price developments or uh, dynamics? Yeah. So, uh, okay, that's a very good question. So, it's the model is is it doesn't sort of take a stance on whether it's rational or or not. Now, um, what the, what you can do is you can microfound the model using sort of like mean, let's say standard sort of like mean variance style preferences and have a rational model of like risk and, and expected return. Now, where does irrationality come in? Is that suppose that there's a certain characteristic, let's say uh, inflation uh, or, uh, or a country's rating that forecasts future, future growth. And suppose that there's a certain relationship between that characteristic now and future growth. If investors, have like way too high or too low price, uh, assign way too high or low uh, weights to that particular characteristic, it's gonna look like, I don't know, like, like, like investors are like overreacting to certain, certain pieces of information. That's gonna lead to sort of like prices are too high or too low and expected returns that are, are, are fluctuating over time. And so we know that we need some sort of notion of excess volatility somewhere in, in, in the system. 
And but to what extent that that's rational or irrational, that's not something that we that we can that we can tell. So in the model, um, like everywhere, sort of like whenever you just use quantity data, what you what you're effectively estimating is something like a, a risk adjusted uh, assessment of that characteristic. And so what it means is that that if I really like a particular characteristic, even though it doesn't forecast future future growth. And maybe the case that that characteristic is particularly uh, useful to assessing the risk according to that according to that investor. And so, um, but it may also be the case that the investor is simply is simply overreacting. And so, it's not that we are ruling out that there is irrationality uh, or that we're sort of or that we can easily we can easily test for it. The one thing that you can do, and which we have done in other work, is we can directly compare those coefficients. To, um, to, to how those characteristics forecast future, let's say, earnings in the case of equities. Um, and you can see which investors have very different beliefs from, from what you would expect purely from that forecasting exercise. And so in that sense, if you think, if you want to take that as a measure of like irrationality, then that would be like one way to, to use these estimates, at least to, to go down that path. Um, but in principle, we can sort of like say that, um, that the model is that the market is like rational or or irrational. I think there's one aspect where the irrationality debate is like potentially like like as a starting point most important, which is in all of our models, in fact, rational and behavioral models alike, markets are very elastic. And I think that's a really important point to to appreciate if we want to think about sort of like like policy interventions. In all of our models, sort of like like you have very volatile quantity shocks leaves and or preferences and very elastic markets. And what we're suggesting is, is markets are in fact inelastic. And now the question is like, why are markets so inelastic? And there, I think you very quickly get into much more behavioral arguments as to like why, if, if equity prices move around, like they fall, let's say 25% in March and they bounce back as much as they did, like why do investors not respond more, more aggressively to those, to, those, to those price movements to sort of make, to make prices more stable? And so I think the key fact, if you want to go down, I don't know, in terms of like where the main challenge is perhaps for standard macro finance models, which has, I think, the closest connection to rational behavioral discussions, it, it is the observation that, that demand estimates suggest demand's inelastic. And so the question is like, why is, why, why is demand inelastic? And that's a very sort of like, like big discrepancy between standard models. And I think most of the theories we have for that suggest that it's much more related to kind of irrationality than 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 something.